Thank you. Okay, uh, talk uh, in general about angel investing and specifically about uh, the Tech Coast Angels, and I'll be happy to answer any questions as well. Uh, so, basically, why did we get that on there? Let me see if I can get rid of that. There. Okay. So, what are you? What is the problems you, as inventors, face? You know, you've got a great idea. You want to translate that into a, a, a great business, uh, but you have limited business experience, and you probably have limited funds. Okay. Uh, so the solution, obviously, is to is to look elsewhere for the funds, and also look elsewhere for the expertise that helps you fill out uh, the roles that you need in your company to go forward and be successful. So there are a number of, number of ways you can uh, approach the funding picture. You can start out by going to friends and family. You have to be a little careful in that process uh, because uh, you can get some pretty messy cap tables, uh, especially if your friends and family are not accredited investors. And at some point in time, when professional investors come in, uh, it usually requires uh, cleaning up the cap table, basically. And by cleaning up the cap table, I mean buying out the non-accredited investors at that point in time. Uh, you can also bootstrap it, taking uh, whatever profits you may be developing, uh, any kind of internal resources from the company to grow the company. But eventually, uh, you know, when you get to the point where you're limited, where you're limiting your growth because you don't have the finances. Uh, you have to go outside and seek other investments. And that's where startup uh, investors come from, whether that's angels, angels, single, angel groups, uh, venture capitalists, some micro VCs around, things like that, that will, uh, that will get involved with early stage companies. And then, of course, uh, the angels not only uh, provide funding, uh, they provide uh, mentoring. Uh, and uh, a Rolodex uh, so to help you out in the process. So they become involved uh, if, uh, if there's a significant enough investment by the angel group, uh, they'll usually take a board seat. Otherwise, they will take an advisor's seat uh, to the board. Uh, or uh, in many cases, they fill in a role that's missing in the C-level the C management structure whether that's a CTO or usually the CTO is there. What they're usually missing is a CEO or a, a marketing person, a CFO, that kind of thing. So who are these angel investors? Well, for one thing, they've got to be accredited. Uh, it's an SEC ruling. Uh, and what, it really, uh, what that really does is it removes the liability off the company. Uh, accredited investors are supposed to be uh, uh, intelligent and sophisticated investors. Uh, so they can't come back later and say, uh, unless there was fraud, can't come back later and say, you know, uh, you lost all my money, I'm going to sue you. Uh, if you're uh, not an accredited investor and it's a friends and family round, that can be problematic. They can come in later, uh, Aunt Tilly, and uh, say, you, you know, you lost my uh, IRA money. and. Uh, uh, that creates a real problem for me, and I want you to give it back to me. So we come, tend to come from diverse backgrounds. Like you, a lot of us are entrepreneurs. Uh, many of us came from uh, C-level positions in, in larger companies. Uh, because we do a lot of life science work in San Diego, we also have uh, a lot of physicians uh, in our group. And as I mentioned earlier, we devote a lot of time uh, uh, as added value along with our resources. And that's through mentoring and coaching uh, the entrepreneur. And we do a lot of this uh, uh, almost with every company. And that's one reason why when we start looking at uh, investing in a company, uh, we look for uh, uh, CEOs or entrepreneurs or founders who are coachable, 
uh, and uh, if they're not coachable, it usually creates a problem for us. <laughs> the Connect folks know that. So let's look at the uh, angel group activity uh, in the U.S. There are, uh, the United States has uh, hundreds of angel groups. Uh, and uh, as you can see there in California, uh, of those things, we've got about 20% of them. A lot of them, in the, as you go from south to north in California, the density of angel groups goes up. Now, angel groups... Uh, I, I guess I should point out what an angel group is. An angel group is usually a nonprofit entity. Uh, the group itself does not invest. The group only exists as a place where investors can come together and as a group do due diligence. Uh, so uh, these are usually 506, 506C6 uh, companies, uh, uh, nonprofit companies, uh, especially here in California anyway. So let me give you a snapshot of ours. Uh, we were founded in uh, 1997 up in Orange County. Uh, we're the, actually the largest angel group in the U.S. Uh, with over 300 members. Uh, as you can see there, we, have, we are spread across Southern California uh, in five networks. Uh, Central Coast, which is West Lake Santa Barbara, Los Angeles, Inland Empire, uh, Orange County, and San Diego. San Diego is the largest of the five networks. Uh, as a group, we have the potential to invest over $15 million a year. Uh, in San Diego, with our little over 100 members at the moment, uh, we have the potential to invest at least $5 million a year. And in fact, when you look at 2012, uh, San Diego led $4.8 million in investments for Tech Coast Angels. Sure. Am I shadowing myself? Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, and this year, uh, you know, we're a quarter into this year, and already we've invested uh, $4 billion in companies. So, uh, so we're very active. And uh, when I took over, one of my goals was for us to become more active uh, and, so, uh, and, and quicker about it. So uh, we are um, priding ourselves that uh, some of that is starting to pay off for us and for you. And if you look back over uh, the years since the founding of Tech Coast Angels, uh, its members have uh, put in $119 million. So let's look at the uh, spectrum of uh, startup investments just to, just to place ourselves in the right, uh, play, uh, right uh, position. Uh, here's a plot. Um, on one side, I have annual growth rate. Okay, these are things that professional investors look at. Uh, how fast is your company uh, expected to grow? How big is your company going to be in five years? Okay. And uh, given those two numbers, uh, then we can determine whether you are in uh, an investable part of uh, of this spectrum of all startups. Because on the one side, 90% uh, of all startups in any given year are lifestyle companies. And lifestyle companies can be very, very good for the founder, uh, but they're not something that a professional investor would get involved with uh, because investors like to get their money back at some time. And, uh, you know, investors are simply donors until we have a liquidity event, an exit. So, uh, so we're kind of hard-nosed about that. Uh, so where we start to play is in these middle market firms. These are the groups, uh, these are the companies that are growing 20 to 50 percent a year with revenue projections up to $50 million in five years. That represents about 10 percent of what you see out there. And these companies get most of their funding either through bootstrapping uh, or through uh, professional investors like angels. And then finally, in the rarefied atmosphere of less than 1% of all startups in any given year are the high potential firms. That's 50 million plus in a five-year projection, over 50% growth rate per year. 
So those are the entrepreneurial forums, and that's where we're interested, and that's where also venture capital starts playing an interest. So what do we want to see in a startup? So if you come to us, we'd like to see that you have a, a horizon, an exit horizon of three to five years. Uh, it didn't used to be that way. And, and in fact, if, and, and for that kind of horizon, we are looking at companies that aren't going to need hundreds of millions of dollars because those companies are going to require VC funding. And when a VC gets involved, uh, the exits go way out in time. So, uh, so we would like to see a company that could be, that could get to an exit on angel funding alone. And that's maybe multiple rounds of angel funding. We'd like to see a 30 or 40 percent return on investment per year. We'd love to see an experienced management team. The angels, uh, any professional investor, looks at two things. They look at the, uh, uh, the primary two things. They look at the, uh, the product and they look at the management team. And so it's the jockey and the horse and uh, most professional investors put much more emphasis on the jockey than they do on the horse. Per year. 30, 30, 30 to 40% ROI per year, yeah. You're looking for a 10X in Well, yeah, 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 uh, averaged over that period of lifetime of the company, okay? Not that, not that every year you have to show that. Uh, going back to li lifestyle is uh, if you have a, a restaurant, a single restaurant, if you, uh, if you have a dry cleaning establishment, that kind of thing. Makes a very good living for the f person that owns the company. Uh, but it's not a growth, you know, they've got one and, and even more than that, they don't want to take any risk. They got a good thing going. So why should they risk growing, uh, if they're, if they're, uh, you know, if it's profitable for them as owners? So yes. So on a given scenario, a million dollars, 30% of the dollars per year, or it's going to be structured like on, uh, net sales? You know, it's going to take, uh, typically it takes 18 to 24 months for you to start generating a positive cash flow, okay? So, uh, so when I say this, I say it, take the lifetime of the company, okay, and divide by the number of years that that was there, and that's where this so figure comes from. Right, right, yeah, yeah. Let, let's, uh, yeah, think of it as, uh, and I'll mention this later, we're looking for a 10x return on our money. Uh, the, why are we doing that? Uh, because most of the companies we invest in are going to fail. Uh, if they don't fail, they're going to be order 1x, one and a half. Okay. All right. Well, we'll yes, you, you're, you're, you're getting ahead of me here. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I'm going to get to, I'm going to get to that place in a second. Thank you, Gary. Where's your wine glass? I'm sorry? Uh, they, they give you a 10x, uh, maybe 20% uh, at most, uh, more like 10%. Ten uh, percent will give you a ten x. Uh, companies, uh, you typically, if you have ten companies in your portfolio, okay, you probably got six or seven still alive. Most are not uh, returning uh, more than you know one, one and a half, two multiples. Uh, there are also those that have have died in that five year period as well. So when you wrap it all up and you're looking at diversifying your portfolio, uh, you're looking for those big exits to compensate for the others. This is risky investment. <laughs> so, uh, but angel 
angel investors recognize that it's a risky. They, they do what they can to mitigate the risk, and this is kind of what I'm talking about tonight. Uh, but uh, in the end, it's a risky business. Uh, as I've said before, ongoing relationship with the management. So what's a typical an angel deal? Uh, this is uh, uh, nationwide. This is from the HALO report. Uh, this comes out of Silicon Valley Bank and the Angel Resource Institute. They do this on a quarterly basis. Uh, so you can go online and type in HALO and you'll find this report. Okay? Uh, and uh, what you see here is the um, median pre-money valuation for a fresh first round investment uh, is two and a half million. Median pre money. Okay. And the median single round investment is on the order of 700,000. Now, what if you're looking for more cash than that? 700,000 is not going to get you to where you want to be. Well, that's where syndication comes in. Now, TCA is big enough that uh, often it doesn't need to consider syndicating because, in effect, we internally syndicate among our five networks. Uh, but smaller groups in particular do a lot more syndication. And as you can see from this pie chart, about two-thirds of them syndicate. So far more, far more angel groups co-invest uh, than go it alone. And when they do that, and you look at the numbers for syndicated deals, uh, they're virtually doubled. So now you're looking at a single round of a million and a half. So where are we putting our money? If we look at it from a deals perspective, uh, what you see is uh, uh, internet uh, leads with 35% or so, healthcare in there with 21%. So between internet and healthcare, uh, you know, more than 50% of the deals that are done uh, in this particular year, which was last year, uh, were in those two, two, category, two uh, sectors. However, if you look at it in dollars, uh, it's healthcare on top. Uh, clearly, uh, it's probably not surprising that life science companies usually require uh, far more uh, resources uh, than uh, a lot of high-tech companies, especially a lot of internet companies. And then if you look at internet there, now it's, now it's down in the fourth position as far as the amount of actual dollars that was put into those deals. So many more deals, but at smaller, smaller raises. So what do we bring? I think I've, I've already mentioned uh, this a couple of times, but uh, you know, we bring direct funding. But one thing I hadn't mentioned is Especially with TCA here, we have uh, what are called VC affiliates, and actually we're going to be, uh, I'm, I'm going to be putting in place a, um, a, new, um, a new category called uh, a VC member, and uh, with the intent uh, of uh, the, the smaller VCs investing alongside of us, as, with us as lead. And what that does is that opens up additional resources, uh, so either funding larger deals or funding more deals. Guidance and team building, won't go with, over that again. And then business contacts, which I mentioned but didn't elaborate on. So, you know, uh, a lot of our p people were in the same business sector as you are, and given anybody in here. Uh, so they know customers, they know vendors, they know strategic partners, they know service providers. And they also help with follow-on financing, whether that's an angel round or some M&A um, or strategic relationship. So what do you want, what do you need to know before you come to us, okay, uh, to maximize uh, your chance of being funded? So before you approach us, remember that, as I'm going back to the earlier slide, we rarely invest more than a million and a half in a single round, okay? So if you're coming to us looking for two and a half million, you're kind of in the valley of death. Uh, it's, it's, it's larger than what an angel will do, and it's usually smaller than what a VC will do. 
Uh, so, uh, so that's not a good place to be. So you need to re structure your structure your cash needs so you're not out there in the two and a half million. Uh, as I said before, most of the deals in the median deals is at 700k. Uh, it, it's interesting, uh, San Diego, in San Diego, our median is higher than this uh, because we tend to focus on uh, startups and we don't do a lot of seed investing. Not that we don't want to, we just don't see a lot of seed uh, companies. Yeah, 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 that's true. <laughs> that's true. In LA, on the other hand, they do a lot of seed deals. And so their round, their average or median round is around uh, 250K. So it just uh, so there's some regional dependence on these things. Now, one of the things is uh, if we're going to come into a deal, we usually want 20% of it. So I'm sure you've all seen Shark Tank and somebody come out and say they want 500,000 and they're going to give them 5% of the company and the sharks go nuts and stomp all over them. Uh, so there is a reason for that, obviously. Uh, and, and one of the reasons is, is if it's a company that's going to require uh, additional funding, uh, uh, you get diluted. And unless that company really grew ra very rapidly, uh, you're going to be in a, a world of hurt as an investor. So if you put those things together, if you put the 700K, if you put the 20% uh, together, uh, that says that uh, if you're coming to us and, and, uh, and, you, and you want 700K where our sweet, sweet spot is, uh, you better not be valuing your company at greater than about 2.8 million because uh, if you add the 2.8 million and the 700K together uh, and then look at what 20% of that is, uh, that's 700K. So, uh, so the post-funding value of 3.5 million, 20% of that is, is what, uh, what we're willing to uh, invest in your company. So uh, you have to keep those things in mind as well. It has to be balanced. A lot of times we have companies come in, especially, especially in the uh, social media space, uh, that have bought into all the hype, uh, know the Silicon Valley stories, and they'll come in with very high valuation, 28 million, and all they have is something on a napkin, uh, and and expect us, you know, to to uh, um, to be interested. Uh, so they're wasting our time, and uh, we're wasting theirs. Uh, that's just not a fit. So be aware of our fit before coming to us. And then here's the coming back to the 10x in, in a three to five year period. Now, realistically, realistically, it's very difficult to exit in three years, right? It takes about three years for a company, once it decides to exit, to actually exit. So, one of the, so what is that saying? That says when you, when you start looking for money and when you put your business plan together, we're now requiring you to provide us your path to exit. So that you've thought it through, and how, you know potential uh, potential acquirers, uh, potential M and A firms that will support you in that process, uh, so that uh, so that we know that you know that this is important. So coming to us, what is that like? Uh, well, you'll go through a pre-screening process first, and if you get through that pre and and. That pre-screening process occurs once a month, and uh, there's two ways that can happen. We can just look at your slide deck and your executive summary, or we'll invite you in, and we invite in five, uh, uh, five companies on the high-tech side, and we invite in, I think it's around five companies on the life science side as well, uh, and you get 12 minutes to present in pre-screen, and you get 12 minutes of Q&A. And then you go away, and we decide on who will uh, actually go to the screening. We've increased the number of companies we screen a month to five from our four. Uh, I know that's not a great uh, increase, uh, but it's helping with some of our backlog. And when you come to screening, you'll have 12 minutes to present. You'll have 12 minutes of Q&A. And then you'll leave the room for 12 minutes while the members caucus. And uh, what the members are uh, caucusing about is they're going through all the things they like about your deal, and they go through all the concerns they have about your deal. 
and then the membership is asked whether they're interested in pursuing it further. Uh, so when you come in and come back into the room as a company, we're going to give you feedback, and hopefully it'll be useful feedback that uh, that will serve you well. Uh, and if we have a number of members that are interested in pursuing this further, that same day you will go to a post screen and you will spend two hours in a deeper dive with us into your company. If in that two-hour process uh, we come up with a deal lead, one of our members that's willing to lead the deal, and uh, sufficient interest um, to, uh, that we think we can get it uh, funded, uh, we'll go into due diligence. Once that triggers, uh, our goal is to get a signed term sheet between you and us in 30 days, okay, from screening to signed term sheet in 30 days. Uh, and that's about the same order as the um, due diligence process itself. Uh, once we have a signed term sheet, uh, then uh, we can start collecting checks from members. And, uh, and the attorneys can finish all the paperwork that has to be done, so we're probably looking at another 30 days uh, for the attorneys to get the paperwork in and for, for us to collect the checks. So it used to be not too long ago, a couple of years back with TCA, it could take months and months uh, uh, to, uh, to complete a deal. And uh, one of the things I really stressed is I want, I want quick turn downs if it's going to be a turn down, and I want them quick, as quick as we can funding, funded, uh, if we're going to fund a company, uh, without sacrificing uh, the due diligence process. So we're still going to go through the full-blown due diligence, but the way we've solved that problem is I hired <coughs> staff and now have two and a half, full, uh, two and a half FTEs and, uh, and a bunch of uh, trainees. That we call them trainees, but they come from Rady School of Management. And they come from San Diego State, and a lot of them are postdoc. Uh, so they've got a lot more education than I do. Uh, so, uh, so that has helped a lot. And so having that, those resources, when you're a volunteer organization uh, and you're relying on your members to do all of the tasks that, a co that you would normally want to do in a company, uh, it, uh, things uh, don't always work smoothly and they're not repeatable and they're not consistent. So having staff really has made a big difference in being able to get money to you if we're interested in funding you. So uh, when you come to us and you've got that 12 minutes, and, and, and I'm sure you know 12 minutes goes very fast when you're up trying to talk about your, your, uh, your product, um, it, we want it to be fruitful bo for both of us. So I'm going to give a few little hints. Uh, first of all, of course, uh, it's a no-brainer that you want to have an effectively organized presentation, and you want to have to practice that presentation to deliver it. And you need to avoid some common mistakes, which I'll go through in a second. Uh, and if you do that, if you, have a, if you have a clear, organized, effective presentation, and, you're, uh, and you avoid some of the um, common mistakes that, that we see, uh, you're probably in the top 5% of our presenters at that point. Uh, and uh, while that doesn't guarantee you funding, it certainly uh, separates you from the herd. So, challenge yourself to deliver an easy to understand story, okay? You can put 100 view graphs together probably in two days. To do the same thing in 10 view graphs will probably take you two weeks. So, uh, so you want to com continually refine your pitch. Uh, so that you're getting your point across. Remember that you know what you know very well, uh, but you're talking to a bunch of investors with a variety of backgrounds. Uh, if you've got a high-tech deal and half the half the uh, uh, those present are life science uh, people, uh, they're not going to know the lingo, uh, and you have to recognize that, and you have to you have to make it very clear and very simple, so that we all grasp it because we have the same 12 minutes to grasp it. Okay. 
and infuse passion you know, uh, into, into what you're doing. We like to see passionate entrepreneurs really passionate about their product. Focus on the benefits for the customer, okay? How, how, how is the customer going to use that? Is it going to simplify their life? You know, we say, where is the pain? And do you have a painkiller uh, or an aspirin? Okay. Uh, so make sure, make it very clear to us who you're marketing your product to and why they would want your pr product. And differentiate your business from your competition. There's nobody in here that doesn't have a competitor somewhere. Uh, and so, uh, and we'll know it. Uh, and uh, we, you know, we, we can use Google too in the audience. Uh, so we can uh, very quickly find your competitors. Uh, so, uh, so what you want to do is you want to very clearly explain how you differentiate yourself uh, from your competition. So don't give us, you know, unclear, irrelevant, or unnecessary information. I've I've had on occasion, you know, you've got you've got 12 minutes to present your case, and somebody will come in and start telling you about their life history before they ever get into the their presentation. So when you come in there, be ready to go. And don't try to impress us with the jargon. It does two things. Uh, it one, it, it confuses us. And you don't want a confused investor. A confused investor is, an, is uh, not an investor, at least not in, that pro uh, not in that product. So start with your idea and why it's valuable. What urgent problem does it solve? Okay, who's going to buy it? Who's your customer? What's the market? What are they going to pay to get this value? Okay, so. You can have the greatest thing in the world, and if you misprice it, uh, uh, it's not going to go anywhere. How is it better, faster, cheaper than the alternative? So you can't just claim it. You have to show us. And this is very important. Uh, will they adopt your new technology before you run out of money? Okay. And it's, it's extremely important to think about, especially the, the more disruptive your technology is. We just had a talk on that. <laughs> that's right. So, yeah, so uh, that's. Yeah, so you have to think about that. Uh, how, how you, you know, and this gets all about the marketing of your product and uh, how you're going to get customer recognition. So, what are good ideas? Well, you know, clearly the next big thing in in whatever market sector you're in. Uh, for example, a new killer app, uh, a disruptive technology. You know, uh, 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 computer desktop com computers came along and disrupted the computer industry significantly. Another product that came through that was a, a convergence of new technologies of computer and a phone to become a smartphone, another area. Uh, and then a novel new application of, of an existing technology and what I'm showing right there is a, uh, a bungee cord uh, and up until this company came along uh, bungee cords just went up and down vertically. Uh, they've changed it to horizontal and started launching skateboarders and snowboarders and things like that. But, uh, yes? Um, when you mentioned like a killer app, going back to your chart earlier when you were saying these are the um, fields that you invest in, an app, would that be considered mobile technology or software technology? Well, yeah, and it's changing so rapidly. Uh, uh, it would be a, uh, it would actually be both right now probably, although uh, there's also social media wrapped up in this as well. And it's funny you should bring this up because I'm leading a deal right now for a mobile app in the social media area for fan celebrity interaction. Uh, and so, uh, okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Is your idea fundable? Okay. Uh, so if you, 
if you've got a product uh, and you're a startup and uh, you're going after a market space, uh, that market space has got to be really large for you to be considered a growth company because you're not going to gain 50% of a market. Okay? You're going to hopefully gain a few percent of a market. So if you come in and tell us that uh, you're going to be a $50 million company in five years, and oh, by the way, my, uh, my market sector uh, is $100 million, uh, you know, we're going to throw you out. Uh, uh, so you have to be aware of that. We're looking for big markets because we know how difficult it's going to be for you to capture much of that market space. Proprietary technology are other strong barriers to entry. There's two, two things. You, you know, if you don't have proprietary technology or strong barriers to entry, you better be running really fast. And, and, and what happens then is what, that even puts more emphasis on the jockey. Okay? The management team for a company that is, uh, going, uh, is, uh, is an execution play that management team has to be extremely good and very agile uh, so, uh, and very, uh, you know, uh, uh, have a lot of experience in that space before, uh, before you consider investing with them. And this, this actually, this social media deal that I'm talking about is one that has no IP and it's purely, uh, purely an execution play. Uh, so do you have a, uh, you can have a large market, but do you have a well-articulated strategy for capturing part of that large market? Okay, so that's also w things we're looking for. And then as I went back, I said, you know, an exit. Uh, this is becoming more and more important to investors uh, is what's the exit going to be? Uh, it used to be, you know, the, the, the process was uh, friends and family, uh, angel investing, VC, IPO. Uh, that all kind of fell apart. Uh, that kind of Sorbanes Oxley uh, and NASDAQ uh, uh, costs and things like that uh, kind of disrupted uh, that path. And so today, what we're looking at primarily is uh, companies that can be acquired. Uh, and what is an, what, does anybody know what the typical uh, size of a company is that gets acquired. You know, we, we, hear about, we hear about the big ones, right? But the average size of a company is 20 million. 20 million. Yeah. Uh, strong management, again, can't reiterate that enough. And uh, and, and again, as I mentioned earlier, your valuation has to fist, fit within our risk tolerance levels. And then uh, you have to have that desire for advice and coaching. Uh, we, uh, we often run into, uh, you know, entre uh, entrepreneurs uh, are going to be passionate about what they're doing. That's great. But they've got to be able to understand that they don't understand everything. And, and it's those folks that we just back away from because nobody understands everything. And, uh, and what, uh, what we're looking for is the guy that says, I don't know everything, and boy, bring it on. Whatever experts you can pile around me, I, I, I love it. You know, that's who we're looking for. So we've gotten to the point now where we say, yeah, we, you, you, uh, we like what you're doing. Uh, we think the market looks good. You're a coachable kind of guy. Uh, you've got a strong management team. What are you going to do with the money when we give it to you? Uh, so we want to see that picture too. So, uh, I, and what we want you to tell us is our money is going to take that company to the next level and materially increase its valuation. What we don't want to hear from you is, oh boy, now we get to be paid and we have all of this debt that we need to pay off, okay? Investors don't give you money to pay off your debt. They give you money to grow your company. 
So that can be a proof of concept. It can be a prototype, you know, a patent filing, as we were talking about tonight, uh, additional market research, uh, product development, uh, filling out the management team, uh, product launch, uh, major contract award, you know, some combination of those things build value in a company. Retiring debt does not build value in the company. So follow-on funding, uh, early money, uh, that is our money, uh, must be used for growth because the next round of funding is going to dilute us. And if it dilutes us more than the valuation has gone up, we've just lost. So we're looking for you to grow that company. We don't care about follow-on funding as long as the follow-on funding um, matches uh, the kind of valuation increase that, that, uh, that your company has undergone. <coughs> Otherwise, we're, uh, uh, we're going to be uh, in, um, uh, highly diluted and basically have a very poor investment. <coughs> we're looking for companies, as I said, that uh, can be quickly ac acquired. Okay? Uh, one, one of the areas that we do not invest in is pharma. And, you know, the angels have a, the saying, angels don't do drugs. And the reason we don't do drugs is because of the enormous amount of money required and the enormous length of time required to get approval. So, as I said, earlier money is inferior to late money. And so we want to see valuation increase in the company. Uh, and that's why we take a big ownership stake up front because we know we're likely to get diluted. So if we start out with 20%, uh, we may end up with 5%. Okay. But now if the company is growing by a factor of four, we can sort of tread water. We'd like to see it grow faster. Okay. So avoid the deal killers. Uh, you, uh, I can't tell you how many times a company comes in and say, you say, well, tell us about your competition. They go, oh, we don't have any. There's no competition in our area. Uh, I must remain president, founderitis. You know, uh, there, there, there are two types of CEOs. There's a CEO that, uh, uh, that runs a company up to about a $50 million uh, level, and that's called a founder. Uh, and then uh, there's the CEO after that point. Those, call, those people are called managers <laughs> and because the company becomes much more complex. So if you're not willing to stand down uh, at, a, at a certain point uh, and you feel like you must retain control of the company or the reins of the company, uh, it's going to raise a red flag for us. Don't come in and say this is our, our evaluation, take it or leave it because um, it'll be a very short meeting. Uh, don't ever come in and say, all I need is your money. Okay. Uh, if we build it, they will come. You don't really have a plan. Uh, I can't explain the technology to you in simple terms. It's just too complicated. You know, we, we get this especially in the high-tech area. Uh, I'm sorry, you, just, you, would, you don't have the background to understand this. Well, everything is explainable. <laughs> And, and what that tells us is you don't know your space well enough to be able to explain it in simple terms. We don't own the IP. That can be okay uh, depending on what, uh, how the licensing is structured. Okay? So that's one of those, uh, uh, as long as you show us how uh, uh, the licensing works uh, and we accept the, the way you've got it, um, we're okay with that. Uh, as this is what I mentioned earlier. You know, we want to, uh, we want your money to. You know, now we've been work. You know, we've been living on uh, uh, 20k a year, and now finally we can do a 200k a, a year salary for the managers. No, that's not going to happen. Uh, you're still going to be at 50k at most uh, because uh, us paying your salary does not grow the company. And us paying down your debt doesn't grow the company either. And finally, if you tell us, you know, I've been back there in the lab and I've been too busy to put together a business plan, but trust me, this is going to be wonderful. Um, we're we're going to send you to Springboard. <laughs> 
Uh, and we don't have shareholder partner agreements, things like that, the paperwork that has to be there. So in summary, you know, an entrepreneur is somebody, when we, when we look at an entrepreneur, okay, we want to see that person more committed than the investors are, okay, able to live on almost nothing, you know, and not interested in long-term control of the company. We want to make sure, you want to see that you're coachable, that you're flexible, because I'll tell you, you think, you know, you've put a lot of work into your business plan and you think your business plan is exactly how the market's going to work. And then uh, you go talk to your first customer and find out, I've got a pivot here. So I found that no business plan survives its first customer. Big, well-segmented markets, we've talked about that. Great products at a sensible cost and pricing. You know, if you're, you, you've got to have the gross margins, <laughs> okay, so uh, because uh, you, you, you go from your cost to the wholesale cost to the, the retail cost. Uh, if, if at the end of that process, your, your product cost might be great, might be better than everything else out there, but if it costs 10 times what everything else out there costs, it's not going to be bought. And then we want to ha ha be assured that the funds that we're giving you transform the company. And then, of course, we'd like to see an early exit as well. So we're going to listen to your presentations. We're going to challenge your strategy, and don't be offended by that. Part of that challenge often is just trying to understand your, your company and your plan. We're going to conduct due diligence. We're going to negotiate the investment terms. And then we, uh, if it all goes well and we get a signed term sheet, we'll write the checks that fund your, your growth. And then after we've written checks, we will be continue to support you uh, as a mentor and as an advisor and uh, often as a board member. So that's it.